I, I was wondering what um, you meant when you were talking about logic. Um, mm -hmm. You several, actually in all the domains, but I was specifically wondering in the case of logic, you were always speaking about um, a, a, a logic being adequate or equally adequate right. um, to sanction inferences. So I was just wondering how exactly you, you were thinking of that. Are you mm -hmm. thinking of um, one logic um, being adequate in order to model certain inferences that people actually make, or is it is there some other notion of adequacy in Good. play here yeah. to, that is kind of completely abstract? Um, right. Good. Well, the point when I give the example of quantum logic is to try to illustrate right that case. So there, assuming a certain conception of quantum mechanics, there is some structure in that domain that generate these non-distributive uh, things. Right, so in that sense, a logic that is uh, distributive doesn't seem to, gener to preserve the relevant information about the domain. Right, so in that case, it will be inadequate. Right, so and so in that case, it's what you're trying to do is you're trying to reason about the domain using the logic. So you're looking at what will be appropriate inferences about these things. Right, um, so that's the notion of adequacy I have in mind. Right? And um, of course, what that means is that logic is not, on this view, is not topic neutral. I don't think. But, but it does it, I mean, it, it seems as if, if that's a constraint, then maybe uh, logic is empirical. Um, well, I wouldn't go as far as it's saying that it's empirical. You can, in a way, I think there is an analogy. I mean, I mean the, the, the thought is this. So if you identify the domain, Mm -hmm. And you have independent ways of so, so you have an independent way of identifying some domain of objects, let's say, and you have independent ways of checking whether um, these objects behave in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was presuming that that independent way is it some empirical. No, yeah, well, process. and then yeah. now if your your logic will be adequate, depending on. That's right. On these empirical facts. Yeah, the, so let's separate in the following way. You can, for example, you can formulate uh, a logic just as you can formulate a mathematical theory, right, as a piece of pure structures, right? You can just study features of, uh, of a logical formalism, right? And in that sense, you come up with whatever you want, right? Uh, and you can check whether it's complete, sound, and so on. But we are interested typically in, uh, in logic as, as a tool for managing inference about certain things. So in that sense, the notion of adequacy will come in, right? And it would, in that case, yes, it would have an empirical constraint, right? Um, so in, I think in that case, that, that example uh, of the quantum, uh, quantum case illustrates how you can empirically uh, challenge a logical inference, right? And um, so, so I guess then the answer is really adequacy is an empirical notion, but maybe logic is just that's right. You, you can think about a lot as a piece of pure logic. It would not be, right? So okay. So there, I'll start here and I'll, I'll go there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. As you can imagine, I agree with. Uh, a lot of things that you have said. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question uh, on the metaphysical uh, relativism. So how far, how deep does the incommensurability go, and where does neo neopyrrhonism start? Because there are some things that uh, one seems to want to rule out. So here's an example. You know, mm -hmm. like there are different ways of thinking about. So let's take a case where the metaphysicians might disagree. Then, you know, the, the concept of individual as applied to unicorns. Mm -hmm. So Kripke would want to say maybe that uh, um, unicorns are not sufficiently determined because what's the DNA of unicorns? So and if unicorns don't have a DNA, if they're, if they're not sufficiently determined with respect to that particular property, then they can't be animals because animals have DNA. Mm -hmm. right. So and if unicorns are not even animals, right. then they're not eligible for existence at all. So uh, 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 now it seems as if there were some criteria, background criterion 
something, uh, uh, so something more going on which helps us to adjudicate. I don't know if you would right. want to call it empirical, but right. something. So some, some views seem to be ruled out, such as um, individuals are objects that have more than three properties. So even though there is, so, uh, so, the, uh, uh, so how do you limit the space there? Because you certainly don't seem to want to say there are infinitely many options. There are n options, and n is smaller than infinite, right? Yes. And uh, in the way in which I have suggested. So I'm just wondering whether this mm -hmm. could add, if, if I were a metaphysician, uh, uh, and in the sense in which uh, 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 a metaphysical absolutist say, then I would want to try to use this in order to say that, well, sooner or later I see there are these neo peronian moments, but mm -hmm. they kick in late. So while I'm going there, you know, when I, before hitting bedrock, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, so not, not, every, not every disagreement is neo peronian Okay, good. Uh, now, that's a great point. So, uh, of course, the bedrock, you reach at the end, right? Yes. But there are other things before that, right? Because even the example of, of the DNA, some metaphysicians would gonna say, look, I'm talking about unicorns, uh, why, uh, or I'm trying to figure out whether unicorns are individuals, why suddenly the notion of DNA became relevant for individuality, yeah. right? So if, why should, because presumably I could apply to things that have no DNA and we still wanna consider them um, individuals of some sort. So there will be disagreement earlier on Right, so, and in each stage, so the Neopironian is gonna say, well, look, there are good reasons to go this way, good reasons to go this other way, how are you gonna tell, yeah. right? And, um, and, and the thought would be, well, it's unclear how you can settle those, uh, those debates. Ah, so, yeah, okay. So, that, that was the move. Yeah, so yeah. Given, given that you will sooner or later hit bedrock and the Peronian situation will apply there, it really already applies earlier. That's right. But yeah. it, it, it just doesn't come out. Yeah. That's that's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, isn't it a problem in a way with, with logical revisionism or, or the willingness to, uh, to revise uh, logical axioms in response to empirical anomalies that, um, as with quantum logic, um, it may make you less critical of the empirical findings or the interpretation of the empirical findings and less ready to look for alternative. Good. There's quite a lot of evidence from people like Cushing and others that the, the well, the, basically Copenhagen orthodoxy in the interpretation of quantum mechanics was enforced with you know, some pretty heavy professional sanctions attached, partly by application of sort of von Neumann and, and Putnam type alternative three-valued or many-valued logics. And it was a way of avoiding actually pursuing other alternative interpretations, perhaps more sort of ontological realism compatible interpretation, like Good. the hidden variables. Good, excellent. So maybe, you know, you should stick to your logic a bit longer at least until you're forced yeah. in extremis, as Quine would say, in more conservative moments to Good. change your logical axioms. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. So the idea is not, you, you encounter a problem, the first solution, well, let's change the logic, right? Uh, you try to do other things, right? And. Uh, the idea here is changing the logic is one possibility, right? It's one alternative among several. You can keep the logic, change quantum mechanics elsewhere, and that has also been done, right? So, uh, but there are cases in which you have to change the logic, right? So if you suppose you would like to know what properties Russell set has, right? Well, you cannot do that in classical logic because it's a trivial object. So you can do it in a, in a pair of consistency theory. And it's actually a very interesting object. It has some properties, it lack others. It's a perfectly you know, interesting object. You cannot study that object you know, unless you change the logic. Right? I would say the, the underlying de facto logic is of course a classical logic. Right? That's the logic we start, and with good reason. It's the strongest one right, than any, any non-classical logic. It's actually un, it's weaker in some respect than classical logic because you undermine one well, at least one form of inference from, from classical logic. So there's good reason to keep classical logic, and you do if you can. In some cases, you know, the logic may be on, get on the way, right? In that, so in those cases, you have you know, the opportunity of, of changing it. So that's the way I think of that. Um. This, by, this went very quickly, so I need, I need some clarification. 
Um, first, to start with about your definition of relativism itself. You take a necessary condition for relativism to uh, be incommensurability. Now, the question of incommensurability I take to be an important feature of this whole discussion. But why do you, uh, of course you're open to legislate the term as you like. Right. Um, but why do you take incommensurability to be a necessary condition? I mean, if you think about relativism, at least in bare bones, to be an absence of um, <clears throat> absolute standards to, to, to adjudicate, that uh, absence may be there uh, without uh, the presence of incommensurability, but you do attach incommensurability to it. And I'm, uh, despite how interesting your comments about the relation between incommens uh, incommensurability uh, to the rest of the story is, why do you take that, why do you legislate that as part of the notion of relativism itself? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons was, uh, I think it's the notion of incommensurability that makes relativism particularly uh, troublesome and intriguing, right? Because if there are no uh, standards of uh, adjudication, uh, no, no, no question bagging standards. Of, no, of, absolute standards. Uh, okay, if you want to, yeah. I, uh, One of the I, reasons yeah. for the absence may be incommensurability, mm -hmm. but there may be no uh, absolute standards to adjudicate on grounds quite independently of incommensurability. That's why I wonder why you were saying ah, I see what you mean. Conditions. Okay, okay. Um, no, that, that's fine. I think um, I probably, in terms of the, this may be an artifact of the sort of examples I was looking at yes. in mathematics and, uh, and logic and, right. and metaphysics, where I think those notions, uh, the incommensurability, were particularly significant there. But I agree with you that in general, yes, you may have lack of uh, uh, capacity to adjudicate, not because of incommensurability alone. Right. Yeah, I agree. Good. Okay, this may be a ridiculous question, but I'm not sure that it is. Um, suppose we agree with your interpretation of the reason to move to quantum logic, and we say, that's a knockdown argument. Why doesn't that just invalidate classical logic and say logic has to be weaker than you thought? rather than saying, well, there's some logics and they're good for this, some logics and they're good for that. As right. it turns out, logic has to be a lot weaker than we'd hoped it was. Good. You, you can do that. If you take that line seriously, you get logical nihilism. Which is? Uh, there's no logic. Uh, because at, this is one example, but I think for each um, principle of classical logic, you find a fairly reasonable counterexample. And, uh, and if you say, well, we have a counterexample, sorry, no longer valid. Okay, but, um, right. so the, the is thought is... Is the case that for each, okay, is each, uh, uh, this, this is a straight out question. Each principle of classical logic, you get a counterexample. Is it the case that for each principle of, say, quantum logic, you also get a counterexample? Or is there, could there be a logic that's weak enough so that it, it extends? Yeah, I think... You may get something that it would, to, that would be so so weak, right? That would probably wouldn't even consider it to be a logic, right? So maybe conjunction elimination, right? Uh, so instead of having that, because that would be the price to be a monist. You say, look, we want one true logic, right? And the logic has to be valid in all domains, right? So we're going to look for that no matter what. Right? And I think if you do that, what you end up with is, um, oh, I, th I think you end up with no logic, but you may end up with something so, so ridiculously weak that it's, okay, it's not clear what much of a role that's doing. So rather than going that way, I say, look, be a logical pluralist. And you think about the domains in which certain logics are adequate. And it's perfectly fine to use them in those domains. Uh, other domains, other logics will be fine for those domains. Uh, and you can play with and draw inferences appropriate for that domain uh, and perfectly fine. Right? And it seems to me that that's a much useful uh, and healthier way of thinking about it than just going for pneumonism and end up with something that's too weak. Well, well what I was worried about, aside from just being curious about it, was um, 
we want to have a way of saying that some things that purport to be logic just aren't. Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, there's a little domain, I've got three or four sentences within which this thing is perfectly okay. You, you still want to say, tough luck, that won't do. So what's the criterion for ruling things out if you're being as tolerant as you are? For, uh, why is it that something does not count as a logic? Yeah, that, 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 uh, suppose I made a, a set of inferential rules that worked for a few cases, and I just said, and that's my domain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, should we say, well, yes, of course you can do it, you can play any game you like, but don't claim you've got a new logic here. Yeah, okay, good. I think to, to have a logic, you, there's a little, there's some more requirements, right? And um, then, of course, I haven't talked about that here, but uh, elsewhere. So the, the idea would be, you want that notion of consequence that I, I mentioned. It has to be, uh, you know, somehow, you, have, you need to have some notion of necessity. It's not just by chance that you have that, that notion. You need to have, some notion of formality, which I think it's important for, for logics. Uh, so there are some constraints of features that you would like logics to have, right? And so that they're not just a little formal grain, right, that you just come up with. Um, but they have to have some scope, right? Thanks, so that was very, very fascinating. I, I, I had a question about the logical part again, and um, basically my thought was that the conclusion might be right, but the details about how you get there are uh, problematic. Um, it was striking to me that you were talking about this in terms of specific domains only. So your Putnam case from quantum mechanics, for example, was, was, was one case. In point, you're looking at the, ev the empirical evidence within that domain and seeing which logic fits best. Uh, and the case would be, well, in this case, you, there is a determinate answer, but it's actually a surprising one. It's non-classical, but so be it. It's a determinate answer. It's not relativistic as a, in its implications. But um, the, 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 so you, my, my thought is you may well be right in, in the conclusion, but there's a problem in how you're getting there. Mm -hmm. And the problem is roughly that Focusing on domains in isolation may be a problem. I mean, shouldn't one look at at least uh, many cases in a more holistic way? Think about the law of contradiction, for example. This is a problem that uh, Graham Priest, I think, may have with his case. He finds certain areas, very limited areas, the set theory, the liar paradox, perhaps moral dilemmas, mm -hmm. uh, where it looks, if you just look at these sort of data, as it were, in these cases, it looks as though you've got, um, you do better with a paraconsistent logic than you do with a, cons a classical logic. But you, you might object to that. Well, but look, I mean, those are just three cases. Uh, shouldn't we look at all of the applications that have been made of the law of contradiction? And if we find that they are massively favorable and that we have a history of bumping into Case localities that look as though they're non-classical, like for example Hegel did, or Plato did in the world of appearances, or, 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 or um, um, Engels did in the Antidurian. Mm -hmm. And we always find that if we persist a bit more, we can get through this appearance, and we find the classical logic, come, uh, at least the law of contradiction, comes out looking pretty good at the end of the day when we work through. Mm, I'm not um, sure. And, uh, well, well <laughs> so, let me try out the yeah. thought. So, so the thought would be that it's not just a question of what happens locally that should determine what, what logic you accept there, but also what's happening across the board. And you, you know, one might therefore take the view that even if, as far as we can currently see, um, you know, a violation of the law of contradiction looks like the, the, the way to describe a particular area. Uh, don't be too hasty. I mean, we've built up this extremely impressive history of the law of contradiction generating theories. I mean, you can argue, I think, quite plausibly that modern mathematics comes out of this in the fifth century. Parmenides establishes the law for the first time, and then the method of uh, reductio ad absurdum proof gets developed quite probably afterwards. Mm -hmm. 
on the basis of that discovery of the law. And then we get lots of mathematics. You know, similar things happen in philosophy, similar things happen in natural sciences. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's generated all this wonderful theorizing. Yep. Um, and we've, as I say, found that the, the difficult cases usually end up being resolved. So we've got sort of quite a strong case for um, doing what Christopher Norris was saying, in effect, but it's a, a certain kind of case. It's in the spirit of your kind of empirical sensitivity, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis logic, um, for not looking at this just locally. Right, good. I think that's a wonderful question, and, um, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic. So just to be clear, right, um, to be a logical pluralist is not to be against classical logic, right? And I think right. you apply classical logic wherever you can. Right? And, and that's the, I would say that's the default assumption. And I agree, for example, most of classical mathematics is done with classical logic. Right? And, uh, and in many cases, it, it's a wonderful tool. Right? But it doesn't work in general. And it's interesting, the cases you mentioned of the law of non-contradiction, I think Hegel or Marx and Engels, I think uh, the law of non-contradiction actually ends up being violated. You know, when you try to make sense of what's going on there. Uh, so I would, I would actually, I think a proper account of those cases would probably generate a slightly different uh, answer than the one you mentioned. That doesn't mean that in many cases the, the law of non-contradiction is the best way to go. Right? And I think classical mathematics is an example. But that doesn't mean that that's the, the case where uh, then now you dictate Across, across the board, because there are cases in which it doesn't, even in mathematics. And as I mentioned, the, the Russell set is an example. You cannot do that, study that, that set in classical mathematics, so you really need to change the logic. Yeah, my point wasn't real, I mean, that was a, an illustration of how mm -hmm. you might mm -hmm. claim that this is the case, this holism is the case. Right. In a relation to a particular classical law, but the, whether you buy that particular case is less important than the, the thought that holism ought to play mm -hmm. a role in the decision. Right. It's not a local decision only. So you, you, the, your your conclusion that that, that um, relativism is, is is not the right way to go might, for example, in in relation to quantum mechanics, be the right conclusion. But the way you decide and the particular result you come up with might be actually different. It might be that sticking locally to quantum mechanics and does indeed make the distributive law look like a good thing to give up. But if you've built up this massive support for it in other domains, mm -hmm. you might um, at least tentatively, maybe more, more than tentatively, hold up giving it up because yeah, of the holistic concern. That's right. Yeah. But you, so the thought here would be, go with the distributive law where it, it, it goes through fine, right? And uh, so your system, you still have an overall system. It's just that instead of having a single logic that brings it all together, you have different logics. So, and, and they were gonna be all right for certain good chunks of that system, uh, not others. Yeah, that, that's an quite good question. I think it's an interesting counter-proposal, but here's another one. You know, uh -huh. The holistic way of approaching it seems like a, at least a sensible candidate and balkanizing the way you're, you're doing. Right. And there's a d d debate about just that issue to be had, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, in a way, that's the, the debate between logical pluralists and monists go exactly in that way, right? And the, the monist says, look, Hold on to your logic, right? And, and, you, and you make adjustments elsewhere, right? And if you need to introduce AP cycles, you introduce the AP cycles and try to motivate those, right? And, uh, and the, the pluralist would say, well, rather than introducing the AP cycle, well, change the domain. And uh, of course, the, as I said, the pluralist, it's not going to change the logic as your first bet because there are also costs, but right? there is informational loss. Right, in many cases. So you don't want to change the logic in a, in a whim. So I, I agree with you in terms of looking at more broadly. It's, it's indeed how, how the debate will, will be run. Right? And of course, then you have to look at the details to see how, how it goes. Did everyone, get a, did everyone get a chance to ask their questions? <laughs>
Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for the question.